we often tend to think of migration as something that is unique to our time. However, many of us will have remember the image of the Syrian boy, Alan Kurdi, who died on his way to Europe while trying to reach the Greek island of Kos with his family in 2015. He'd also died with his brother. Greek authorities said at the time that his family was among a group of refugees who were desperate to get to Europe <coughs> to escape Islamic State. Migration and images of people fleeing in boats and desperately trying to arrive to Europe has not diminished since 2015. It has remained a constant theme. It is an ever-present ever present feature of in our newspapers, current affairs programs, and in the feeds of our social media outlets. Depending on what we have read in social media, the algorithm can often even propose articles which it thinks um, align to our views on migration. There are some media outlets who would even have us believe that <coughs> Europe is under attack from migration. However, migration is, either, is neither a theme that is exclusive or unique to the 20th or 21st century. Migration, voluntary or forced, is as old as time itself. We should remember that present-day migration to Europe is only part of the story. Migration has not always been to Europe. In fact, it has been quite the opposite. People tried very hard in the recent past to leave Europe. Many were even desperate to leave Europe. We do not have to go far back in history to see this. If we look at the 19th century, which is the primary focus of this talk, migration was as controversial a topic then as it is now. More than 35 million Europeans crossed international borders between 1881 and 1914, and nearly 23 million of them then travelled onwards to the United States. If we go further back in the 19th century, we can see between 55 and, eight and 58 million Europeans moved to either North or South America during the period of 1846 and 1940. It should not be said, however, or believed that migration in the 19th century was exclusive to Europe. It was not. If we look wider than Europe, s between some 48 and 52 million people, mostly from India and southern China, moved or migrated to Southeast Asia and the islands of the Indian Ocean between 1846 and 1940. Another 46 to 51 million left northern eastern Asia and Russia to travel to Manchuria, Siberia, Central Asia and Japan. The subject of this talk is however limited to Europe. And as, we, as I have said, the Americas were invariable the primary destination for people from all over Europe who were looking to migrate. Many Italians, Greeks, Irish, Swedes, Norwegians and Russians, to name but a few, attempted, for various reasons, to travel to the Americas and other countries in the New World, such as Canada and Australia. Many of these migrants travelled directly, by steamship. Others stopped en route. Maybe they stopped to earn money for a ticket to the next stage on their destination, Others had to stop f due to illness or for family reasons. Some of these migrants managed at a later stage to continue their journey to the New World. Others did not. We should also not forget that travel in the 19th century, in particular before the advent of the steamship, was precarious, uncertain and very long. Before the age of the steamship, the journey to America from a European port such as Hamburg or Liverpool could take anywhere between 30 to 40 days. So in an effort to understand some of the reasons behind this migration, this great migration in the 19th century, I would like to look at the migration of a small number of Jewish immigrants, primarily from Eastern Europe, from modern day Latvia, Lithuania and Ukraine and Russia, who traveled to Cork, 
a city on the southern coast of Ireland at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. When one tends to think of Ireland in the 19th century, one tends to think of a country more of immigration rather than immigration. It is true that between, in the decade alone between 1851 and 1861, just after the Irish famine, it is estimated that 81% of all immigrants, approximately 990,000 immigrants to the United States were Irish. Nevertheless, a small group of Jewish immigrants, many on their way to the New World, did, however, arrive and settle in Cork, albeit for a brief period of time. While, of course, this small group of European um, uh, this small aspect of migration to Europe by these small group of Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia cannot tell the story of European migration during the 19th century. There are many elements in the story that are characteristic to the stories of many other migrants from Europe at the time. So why did a small number of Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia leave and end up settling in Cork, a city in a country that was more familiar at the time for exodus than arrival. Histories have been written, historical documents are many, biographies, autobiographies have been written, told and retold. Over time, the history of this group of migrants has been condensed to three things. The reasons often cited for the arrival of this group to Cork were one, fear of persecution, fear of persecution uh, from the programs which were taking place in and around the Russian city of Odessa. While this was far from where the Jews originated in modern day Latvia, Ukraine, there was nevertheless the fear. There was also the fear of conscription to the Russian army. Similar to nowadays, at the time, during the 19th century, many Jews were conscripted, conscripted for up to 25 years to the Russian army. The second reason was similar for many migrants, economic reasons. And the third reason, which tends to dominate in the narrative of the community, is accidental arrival. Many state and the uh, ancestors of the community still state that they arrived by accident. If we read the biographies and autobiographies of the community, we will come across quotes like, you know something, I thought it was New York here, because the bastard in Lithuania who sold me the ticket said it was New York. Or they will say things like, Cork, and they understood it was New York, and off they got. They all thought that they were in New York. Or another quote, the majority of them didn't set out for Cork, but the first few that arrived uh, here said that the captain either took their money, threw them off, or told them they could rest here for a while um, before continuing on their journey to New York. Or they were sick, or they were poor, or they had no more money. It was said they could row from Ireland to America if they rested here for a few days. Now, it is not the role or the aim of this speech to question or to doubt anyone's family history. However, a more nuanced, deeper study of the history of this small group to Cork is needed. And when undertaking any historical research, the importance of reliable, primary and secondary, cross-referenceable -refer sources cannot be underestimated. So for the next part of this uh, presentation, I will reference the census records of 1901 and 1911, parish, school, and communal records, as well as newspaper archives. Let's begin with the census. While uh, caution should be taken with any source, also the census, the census in Ireland of 1901 and 1911 nevertheless give us a bird's eye view of the population on that one night. As Ireland was part of the British Isles at the time, legislation was needed for each census. Information such as date of birth, place of birth, religion, profession, and address were all obligatory points to be included in the census returns. 
So if we look briefly at the 1901 census, we can see there were over 400 people listed as being Jewish and living in Cork at the time. Just under half of those Jews living in Cork at the time stated their birthplace was Russia. However, if one is to take at face value the narrative of accidental arrival, persecution and escape, these figures would seem to corroborate the narrative. They imply that the group left Russia and arrived directly in Cork. However, the information in the census does not mention or explain any other reasons for this arrival, reasons such as academic, um, excuse me, uh, economic or infrastructural reasons for this gradual migration to Cork. However, the fact that another 235 um, people listed as Jews in the census had either been born in Cork or elsewhere in Europe not only shows us the young age of the community, but also the fact that the journey to Cork had taken place in stages. Many of those Jewish immigrants to Cork had previously arrived in ports in Britain, such as Hull and London. While 141 children were listed in the census as having been born in Cork, 28 had been born in England a further 29 in Dublin, 14 in Poland, and one in Germany. So again, from looking at the places of birth, we can see that the migration was gradual. It was done in stages to Cork. A further examination of the births shows, revealed three places in England, Manchester, Leeds, and Liverpool. Why is this important? Manchester was not only a major Jewish population centre in the 19th century, but it was also a stop on the newly opened Leeds to Liverpool train line. Liverpool was one of the main ports of travel to Ireland and ultimately to the New World. Between 1830 and 1930, over 9 million immigrants sailed from Liverpool for a new life in the New World. Many of these steamships stopped at ports in Ireland, such as Cork, before continuing their journey. You will be familiar with one of these steamships, which arrived in Cork in 1912, the Titanic. So before we continue, let us look at some of the names in the census. By looking at the names, we get, an, again, a more nuanced, detailed image of the community. So let's take three families. The first family, the Cohens. We see the father, Hyman, was born in Russia. The mother, Esther, was born in England. One child was born in Cork. And seven were born in England. If we take the Kamanskis, the father, Louis's place of birth isn't listed. The mother's place of birth is listed as Germany. And four children were also born in Germany. And the Marcus family, both parents were born in Russia, Ch three children were born in Cork, two more were born in Dublin. So again, by just looking at these three families, we can see, or gain a more detailed picture of the migration, that many of the community had lived elsewhere before arriving in Cork. So let's look in briefly at this stage migration to Cork. When we think of migration nowadays, we think of uh, low-cost airlines such as the Irish company Ryanair. However, migration to Cork, or migration to anywhere, was always business, and this was the same in the 19th century. Before we look at that in more detail, let's briefly look at the 1911 census. Again, there were some 401 entries of Jewish people listed in Cork. 173 births were listed as in Russia. 159 in Cork. A further 37 in England, again including places such as Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool. So again, we see from the 1911 census that the population was young. People had migrated primarily in families and had lived elsewhere, maybe for a brief period, before settling in Cork. So let's come back to this idea of migration as being unique to our time. 
Migration in the 19th century was equally big business. The steamships that sailed between Europe and the Americas created fierce competition amongst themselves. Ships leaving the Americas for Europe often carried grain. They needed a cargo on the westward journey uh, to the Americas to make a profit. Immigrants were the easiest and the most economic cargo. Aggressive advertising in the immigrants' own languages appeared in newspapers. Here we see an advert in Yiddish for a, um, a steamship to South Africa. Often to boost sales, the shipping companies made the journey more affordable by selling tickets for different stages of the journey. In 1898, there were some 10 companies known as the North Atlantic Shipping Ring, which fixed the price for the voyage amongst themselves. The cheapest tickets cost around seven uh, pounds to the US. However, if you traveled via Great Britain or Ireland, this then was uh, reduced to five pounds. So this staged migration was encouraged by econo for economic reasons to boost the profits of the shipping companies. Another factor we should keep in mind when thinking of this migration to Cork and onwards to the New World is the expansion and the proliferation of railways in Russia, Eastern Europe and ultimately Britain. The opening of the railway line from Romy in modern-day Ukraine to the port of Libau in modern-day Latvia ran through some of the most populous areas of the Pale of the Settlement, the area in, in modern-day Russia and the Baltic countries that includes Gomel, Minsk and Vilnia. Train companies often had deals, combined tickets, or would allow the immigrant to buy a train ticket to the port, where they could then stop, maybe work a little, to earn money for the ticket for the steamship. According to the Man Manchester Guardian, the in 1844, the direct train line between Hull and Liverpool, which had recently opened, had brought the, ocean, the German Ocean and the Irish Sea within a few hours of each other. One also should not forget the geographical location of Cork. The harbour faces south to the Atlantic. Transatlantic traffic had increased steadily since the Irish famine of 1846 to 1851. By the late 19th century, over 1,000 people a week were travelling to Cork to take a steamship to the New World. So therefore, with this information and the information of the census, we can see that the migration to Cork was a stage process over a period of time, months, years even. The information of the census shows us that it was also for many temporary. Cork was a stopping point on the journey before they could travel to the Americas or South Africa. Multiple sources allow us to not only verify this material, but also give us, at times, more detail. So the next primary source I would like to look at is the record books of the Cork Hebrew Jewish community. The record books, again, show us that ticket prices, train routes, steamship routes, all played important factors. If we <coughs> take an entry from 1901, from May 1901, we see a Mr. Jackson, who was the president of the Cork Hebrew community at the time, has tendered his resignation. He plans to leave Cork for America. On the same day, W. H. Levy, the treasurer, also resigned as he was leaving Cork for South Africa. A year later, in 1902, Mr. Goldfoot leaves as he is travelling to Dublin. Two months later, in 1902, Mr. Tuhi signalled he was also leaving Cork to move to South Africa. So, as we have seen, reliable primary sources help us not only to better understand this mass migration during the 19th century, but also to nuance the picture and to better understand the individual behind the statistics. So, what about this accidental arrival to Cork, which I mentioned? Again, it is more complicated and cannot simply be dismissed. 
The Jewish Chronicle newspaper of the time reports in 1891 of the steamer, the Edam, being wrecked off the coast of Cork on its way to America. The passengers had to disembark in Cork. Some remained in Cork, some traveled, uh, continued their journey later. Again in 1899, the newspaper reports of the steamship, the Alessia, which was on its way to New York from Hamburg, had broken down and had to be towed to Cork. Again, it is possible that people, passengers remained in Cork. Such incidents were not just unique to Cork. In 1891, we know another steamer, the Dumbledam, had to be towed to Plymouth in England. She had also broken down on her way to America. The next stop on her journey was Cork. So these show sources show us that maybe there was some accidental arrival to Cork. We cannot discredit it. This talk, while short, has attempted to show that Jewish migration to Cork, like other migrations in the 19th century, was the result of many different factors. It cannot, nor should it not, be reduced to a reductive narrative of um, accidental arrival, persecution, or escape. I hope, by having looked at a small aspect of migration, which took place in the 19th century, by a small number of Jews to Cork, that I have given you a small insight into European migration. The Irish writer James Joyce says, it is in the particular that we find universal. There are aspects of this story that are similar to the stories of many other migrants during the 19th century. I encourage you to examine multiple reliable sources, primary and secondary, when researching any topic, not just migration. And finally, as I have shown you with the census of 1901, it is important to remember that behind every statistic, there is an individual with their own personal story. Thank you.